Um, and uh, in 1970, when I moved here, I tell people that uh, I used to be able to walk down 18th Street on a Friday night and maybe see three people on the street, and the only place that was open was Million Owls. <laughs> Million Owls is still there, but uh, there certainly are a lot more people on the street today than there were uh, back then. Uh, I became a member of an artist cooperative that was on 18th Street, maybe 200 yards from here. And across the street from us was a, a brownstone full of yippies. And next to that was a Gala Hispanic Theater, which is now uh, on 14th Street. And one day, one of the uh, hippies in, the, in that collective came and said, we need a neighborhood event. We said, OK. So collectively, we moved to uh, get a bandstand from the city. And we blocked off half of uh, 18th Street from Columbia Road down to Belmont. And for those of you that don't know, that was the very first Adams Morgan Day. As you know, it's very different today. But that's how it got started. It got started with personal energy, uh, people wanting to make some change. Um, that co-op um, has a very unique name. It's a familiar name to the neighborhood. It was Madam's Organ. Today it's a bar. It's not the same building. Uh, but uh, it was a, an artist cooperative um, uh, that did exhibits uh, on, uh, on, on 18th Street. Now, I want to pass these out. So if some of you in the front row would come up. Just pass these around and share them and kind of experience them. We're going to come back and chat, with, chat about those in a, in a little bit. Um, one of the um, other things that, that happened to me that really preceded my journey was um, when I was in high school, I excelled in biology my freshman and sophomore year. It was interesting because I really wasn't interested in being a scientist. Uh, but as an elementary school child, I did a lot of drawing. And as a result of that, uh, I had developed the cognitive ability to see. So when I got to uh, high school in my freshman and sophomore year, what really happened is that I already had this cognitive ability to see, and I was able to um, uh, see an am amoeba, a paramecium, this bone, that bone. Uh, and it was really easy for me. And so years later, I began to really realize that what had happened is that this cognitive area that I had developed, I was able to use that to move into another area. This idea that I could take a, a skill that I had mastered to a certain extent and use that in another arena. Excuse me. Here in DC, we're in a unique city in that uh, there are a large number of people in various kinds of professions. And uh, with that, we have a large number of people who have a significant number of skills. And so part of what I'm going to talk about today is how those skills can be used. And quite frankly, you've heard it from the other speakers today already. Uh, oh, I've got to get my clicker out here. Too much technology. Artematic. Because Artomatic plays into this. Um, Artomatic got started in 1999. And really, the way it, there was no master plan. Uh, it was a group of artists, and we found an empty space, and we were going to do an exhibit. And uh, every Saturday morning, I would give a tour. And the next thing I knew, our expectation was about you know, 25 artists. Next thing I knew, 100, uh, 350 artists. Uh, participated uh, in a 90,000 square foot uh, property, the old Manhattan Laundry on uh, Florida Avenue uh, between 13th and 14th. And we had 25,000 visitors. We learned something from that. One of the things that we learned was that there was a real interest uh, in the part of um, the community to see art that was not preordained. Because all the artists who exhibit in Artomatic 
Uh, there's no jury, so any artist can participate. It's open to any artist. It's open to the public for free. Uh, it creates a different relationship uh, between uh, uh, the artist and the audience because when the audience comes in, nobody has told you what to like or not like, and the, the whole event is, uh, is open to discovery. Let me compare uh, 1999 with 2009. In 2009, we had a uh, 275,000 square foot building. We had 1,200 visual artists. We had 2,000 performers who executed 600 performances on three stages. We had two education rooms. We had a film room, and we had a poetry room. We were open for six weeks, just like we were in 2009 and we had 76,000 visitors. We have created something that really is quite unique uh, because it is artist run and artist driven. There's no paid staff. Every artist contributes uh, three five hour time shifts. What's important about that is that it really fits our mission. The mission of Artomatic is to build community among artists, build an audience for artists, and to focus on the temporary use of space. And people often ask, uh, did you have a vision for this? And quite frankly, if someone had told me in 1999 what the data that I just gave you in 2009 was, I told you you were crazy. Uh, the reality is, is that Artomatic has, has grown and, and uh, uh, changed as a result of the people that participate in it. Because everybody that participates in it brings a whole new set of skills. You've actually heard that from many of the speakers today. But it's taking those skills and putting them in a different uh, arena and, and utilizing them. And I'm going to talk about uh, four women who have done that here in DC to give you some idea of uh, uh, how that activity uh, uh, takes place. Uh, lastly, about Artomatic is that we're now in a position where Artomatic is now licensing other artist communities to create their own Artomatics, just like Ted is licensing TEDx events. And that really speaks to the growth and the capability of the, of the effort. Passion creates permission. And I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, this effort of, of uh, an individual's passion and what that really means uh, to, um, uh, to the individual and to our, and to our community. Um, Part of it has to do with um, how we perceive ourselves and what our capability is. And you've also heard that from other speakers as well. Um, back in 1961, I was at university, and I'd heard about this thing called the Peace Corps. And a group of people came to, to the campus to uh, potentially recruit volunteers. And when they came, I went to interview with them, and they wanted people who were in farming and agriculture and you know, I grew up in a small town in Ohio. A lot of the kids that were in school with me were, uh, were farmers. But, you know, my closest thing to farming was helping my mother uh, dig up uh, daffodils and tulips and replant them. Uh, so I said, you know, they're not going to want me. And I didn't want to deal with rejection. So I uh, took the application when I left school. Actually, I was kicked out of school. That's a whole other story. Um, and... Um, uh, uh, took the application, and about two months later, um, I'd heard that a colleague that I knew uh, at the university uh, had gotten into the Peace Corps. And I said to myself, you know, if he can get in, I can get in. And I submitted an application and wound up going uh, in the first cohort of uh, Peace Corps volunteers uh, in West Africa, in Liberia, in 1962. Uh, that taught me a lesson about how you might perceive yourself and whether or not you're going to be accepted. And the fact is that you've got to step out there uh, and you've got to present yourself. Part of uh, uh, my own experience uh, here in Washington, I completed a career. In essence, I retired from the federal government. Um, and one of the unique things that happened, and I listening to all the presenters today really brought that home. 80% uh, of the supervisors that I had in the federal government were women. 
it creates a unique kind of leadership. And Washington is unique in that respect because the federal government required those kinds of things. Probably not enough, and it needs to be done more. But it really made a difference in terms of the kind of leadership that I felt that uh, I was working with uh, during my career. I want to talk a little bit about four people that I'd like to introduce you to. The first person is Lovely Beasley. And these are individuals, excuse me. These are individuals who have chosen uh, to call what I, uh, I use the term shift, where they've taken those skills, very much like the artist in Artomatic who bring their whole set of skills to the table. Because just because somebody can perform or play in a band or, or dance or uh, 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 create a painting doesn't mean all the organization that goes on to make something happen. And um, uh, uh, Lovely and the other three people that I'm going to introduce you to are examples of that. Here's a young woman, had a, uh, uh, did what her parents wanted her to do, became a professional, was very successful, um, who then decided that she created a business proposal to her mother uh, to be co-owner for Twins Jazz on U Street. Uh, not only that, she created the Twins Jazz Foundation, and she's been working on mentoring and programs with young people for the last 10 years. She was also one of the founders of uh, an organization of um, uh, women of color, uh, artists who are of color, women. Uh, the other person I wanted to introduce you to is Svetlana Latek. Svetlana uh, was originally from Yugoslavia, came to the United States. Uh, she, now, she has a master's degree in architecture uh, from Savannah uh, College of Art and Design. She came here. Uh, she began working uh, in uh, doing design work and architectural work for the um, manufacturing industry and the public sector. Um, she started a blog. Um, the blog became very popular, which then turned into uh, brightest young things. Uh, what was interesting about this whole effort is that she followed her passion and she started the blog because she was not satisfied with the kinds of uh, images and, the, and um, messages that were being sent out about uh, creative performances in DC. Brightest Young Things today is now an LLC. She's a, and a co-owner. She's got six employees. So by following her passion, she created an organization. But not only that, she was able to achieve what her passion and her interests were. The next person is um, Kira Carpenter. Kira has a master's degree in policy uh, from uh, Harvard. Uh, she worked internationally with NGOs, was a free, uh, freelance writer. Um, and uh, Kira stepped back into the kitchen. Uh, Kira created Domku, a cafe and bar on Upshur Street in uh, Petworth. But more important, this organization that she created, this, this restaurant and cafe and bar that she created, she helped start a farmer's market. She uh, started a uh, Christmas uh, uh, festival in the, in the neighborhood. So she saw food and this restaurant as a, um, uh, if you will, a community development tool. Uh, and uh, she's now created something called Nourish. Uh, she uh, partnered with uh, Think Local First. They created something called the Startup Kitchen. Her restaurant was closed on Monday. She said, well, let's put this to use. Uh, they did a shark tank, selected a chef who ran, that chef ran the kitchen uh, for six weeks to get a kickstart in terms of what that chef wanted to do uh, with their food. Uh, Philippa Hughes. Uh, Philippa uh, had, was involved in investments and securities as a lawyer here in Washington. And uh, she too started a blog that became very popular. Uh, and as a result of that uh, blog, she created, uh, which was called the Pink Line Project, um, she too created a job for herself as well as a job for others in terms of the, her following her passion in terms of what she wants to do. 
lastly, if you could bring those items that I passed around that people who's ever got those, bring those up. Uh, and as those are coming forward, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. These items that I passed around, you'll notice that this one obviously was quite different from the others. And what's unique about this is that if you put it in your hand, you can move it around, it, you, you feel comfortable handling it. This happened to have been a design project that I had when I was in school. And the idea was to create something that felt good in the hand. These three objects have the potential to be this. And they have that potential because of incremental uh, human intervention. And so uh, a pocket knife or a, 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 a piece of sandpaper uh, can create some, something like this out of that. One of the things that uh, I would like to leave you with is the idea that uh, you are or you can be a part of a transforma transformation of yourself very much like the artist in Artomatic did. And in fact, let me just tell you one story about one artist, Chuck. Chuck was a collector of um, disposable things in our community. And he had a bicycle and he had a bag on the bike and he'd pick it up. But he took those and assembled those into wonderful sculptures. They were just tremendous. And one day when, at the exhibit, I went to Chuck and I said, Chuck, this is really great. You're, you're an excellent artist. And Chuck says, I'm not an artist. And I said, Chuck, you are. Chuck was interested in doing what he was doing, but he didn't want to put a, uh, a, a name on what he was doing. And the result was that two years later, Chuck now exhibits throughout Washington in terms of found objects. Uh, and Artomatic provided that, that opportunity. Um, and uh, I find myself... Uh, The four ladies that I, that I introduced you to, plus myself, uh, we stand ready to help you in, uh, in any way that we can uh, as you begin to make that shift in terms of what your professional capabilities are to uh, uh, follow, being able to follow your passion. And thank you.